I was explaining the reasons why it is interesting to study imbalanced Fermi gases. One reason was uh, yet unobserved um, uh, pair, yet unobserved uh, condensation of Cooper pairs into states uh, with a finite momentum. One more reason. Remember, I was telling you how great uh, ultra-cold gases are. Uh, and they are great because um, one, I think the biggest re reason uh, why, they are great, why they are great is that uh, interactions can be tuned uh, in those uh, gases. Uh, for example, this um, phenomena of the crossover from a Fermi gas of Cooper pairs to Bose-Einstein condensate uh, of uh, uh, tightly bound pairs, this problem was d discussed in uh, several areas of physics. It was discussed, uh, you saw, for the excitons. Then this crossover from a Fermi gas to Bose-Einstein condensate was, um, it was, um, discuss it was discussed uh, for superconductors. It was discussed um, uh, for uh, quarks uh, that, um, uh, that uh, the qu quarks also should form Cooper pairs, and the, as the interaction changes, uh, they uh, form Bose-Einstein Bose condensates of pairs, because quarks are also fermions. But uh, this uh, phenomenon was uh, realized only in um, ultra-cold Fermi gases. So this tunability of um, interactions is um, indeed a rare occasion. But this beautiful tunability of interaction it's possible, it's possible only for S-wave interactions, uh, only for head-on collisions. But there are very interesting phenomena related to um, high partial waves interactions, P-wave interactions, D-wave interactions. For example, a um, big unresolved question is uh, high temperature superconductivity in uh, layered systems like cup rates. And in those systems, um, uh, the pairing is primarily in the D wave um, uh, channel. So, uh, so interaction involves exchange of um, angular momentum. And for ultra, uh, so this example of why those um, higher angular momentum interactions are interesting. In ultra cold atoms, so far, uh, no stable uh, atomic gases were created with a uh, with the P wave or D wave interactions. Those interactions were demonstrated, but no stable gases. And the reason, again, is the three body collisions. Let me show you what happens why P wave um, uh, ultra cold gases uh, are so, so far not achieved. And maybe you can think and contribute to achieving such ultra cold gases with P wave interactions. I showed you um, uh, Feshbach resonances for S wave interactions. Also, there are, P, uh, there, are, there are Feshbach resonances for P wave um, interactions and high partial waves. So, let me. For, and for simplicity, let's think about interactions in, a, uh, in one spin channel. This is potential for P wave interactions. Of course, there is centrifugal barrier here. That's R, the distance between the atoms. And strong, um, and strong, uh, strong level of interaction means somewhere near zero, there is a bound state or quasi bound state above zero. Such, such state has a large, a large wave function. Large wave function overlaps uh, with a with a wave function of free unbound pair, and uh, with a, for S wave interactions, two atoms interact. They are in opposite spin states. The, for atoms in opposite spin states, it's hard to populate bound state because collision with third atom is needed, and if you, there is a mixture of um, uh, two uh, spin species, it should be in three body collision, an atom, with, uh, an atom with the same spin would be involved. And Pauli exclusion principle prohibits for these two atoms to, to get together.
This is for S-wave collisions, and that's why in S-wave collisions, three-body process is uh, three-body losses are strongly blocked. But for P-wave collisions, for P-wave collisions, um, P-wave collisions allow at the two-body level, P-wave collisions allow f to collide um, uh, allow to collide for the fermions in the same spin states. They can come together. And this is uh, an easy way for three-body collisions. Now, Pauli blocking principle uh, does not prohibit uh, for two fermions to come together. And of course, Pauli blocking principle does not prohibit for three fermions to come together. It means that uh, when there are strong P wave interactions, when there, uh, for the, when there is energy level close to, a, uh, to zero energy, uh, nothing prohibits for those three fermions uh, to come together and two fermions make a bound pair which goes into the bound state and the third fermion is flying away with the extra energy so the system heats and this is the reason why so far there are no stable fermi gases with a p wave interactions with a with a flat trap with square shaped potential it might be possible to get such p wave interactions why trap is important why, while we are talking about very local process of, uh, colli of collisions of two tiny particles. Well, again, there is a, the idea is the following. Let's consider here. Again, we consider imbalanced Fermi gases. Now they're important for, uh, for P-wave interactions. Trap uh, is important to uh, get rid of this uh, phase separation phenomenon when uh, uh, the core of the gas becomes fully paired and, um, and the excess um, uh, polarized atoms get to the edges. And in this flat trap, what happens? For simplicity, let's consider all, all atoms are in the same spin states. They are red in color and there is one more atom in the other spin state. And this, uh, this may remind you uh, the, the problem of the Friedel oscillations. When there is a Fermi C of a spin polarized uh, non-interacting non gas and one impurity is um, impinged into this uh, Fermi C, uh, there appears um, uh, Friedel oscillations in the momentum space. At the same time, oscillations in the momentum space are similar, of course, necessarily bring about uh, oscillations in the real uh, coordinate space. And uh, those maj majority atoms, they, they would start uh, scattering on those uh, uh, oscillations, uh, on those density oscill oscillations, and th this would uh, create effective this would create an um, effective potential for uh, the atoms with the same spin states and this is a way to, g to how to get from a and the those other atoms in the in the two different spin states they would interact via s wave collisions but this should create effective interactions uh, uh, with uh, between atoms in the same um, spin state, so the effective spin interactions. And actually there is um, a prediction back from the 90s uh, that uh, again P-wave pairing is possible in such situation and uh, so this uh, flat trap uh, is a way to uh, create uh, ultra-cold gas with a P-wave um, uh, pairing. So there are two prospects for this uh, uh, new experimental tool. New experimental tool is it gives, uh, usually brings some new uh, physical, uh, uh, some new physics. Okay, this is so far with the uh, fermions. Uh, now let's talk about correlations. Uh, in the previous lecture, there were discussion of uh, 
uh, uh, there were discussion of the uh, chains like uh, the Izina models, uh, more sophisticated uh, two-dimensional systems. And very often uh, you've heard uh, that, uh, and you know, some of you know from your research that uh, correlation between uh, properties of distant elements. Uh, I'm, I'm important, uh, they, br uh, they bring information, uh, some information about state of the system. And here, I would like to give you an example how to measure correlations with uh, ultra-cold atoms. And purposely, on one hand, I will uh, present very simple situation. It will be one-dimensional chain. A and uh, also, I will talk about uh, uh, a technique which is um, not finished, so it needs some critical input and it needs some theoretical input. So maybe some of you uh, can suggest uh, something interesting either today or during the banquet or at some point later in the future. During the banquet? After banquet. Well, yeah, Any time. Suggestions are always welcome. And uh, uh, you would see that uh, in physics, uh, to do um, any new measurement, uh, you have to invent something. So uh, be behind each measurement, there's, there should be some phenomenon. Let's consider a very simple situation. A chain of Bose-Einstein condensates. This is the photograph of those Bose-Einstein condensates. And this is how they are physically created. Again, this is a standing wave trap, which I have shown you before. It's a standing wave made by two counter-propagating uh, counter beams. There are, uh, of course, uh, there, there are anti-nodes with a maxi maximum of intensity. And the atoms are trapped into, in those anti-nodes. Uh, the, the laser beam has pretty large wavelength, 10 microns which means there is big separation between uh, those micro traps uh, where, where, where the Bose-Einstein condensates are trapped. So this is just five micron separation. Five microns, which means uh, on a microscope uh, they can be uh, resolved. And this is a photograph. Each white stripe is a Bose-Einstein condensate, and this is the distance in microns. Each, each Bose-Einstein condensate per is, pretty, uh, is pretty small, and um, about 1,000 uh, uh, bosonic molecules in each uh, uh, condensate. And uh, the goal is, the ultimate goal is uh, to measure correlations between phases of those condensates um, along uh, the chain. And we're, we're in the next uh, uh, approximately uh, 30 minutes we shall be, uh, or maybe shorter, we shall be progressing towards this goal. Each Bose-Einstein condensate uh, in the simplest approximation it can, be, um, it can be described by its own wave function. Each wave function has a phase. And for simplicity we shall consider wave function only along this direction which we shall call Z direction. And uh, each wave function, it has the same absolute value. Those are very similar condensates. But um, condensa each condensate uh, may have its own phase. So the wave functions are Gaussian, but each one is multiplied by its own phase factor. If the condensates suppose, uh, suppose uh, have never knew about each other, they, uh, they would have completely uncorrelated phases. Or if we allow condensates to tunnel between the wells, the phases would correlate. And uh, to get some initial understanding of the system, we shall look back into the 19th century. There was an experiment in uh, 1836 by William Talbot. Uh, William Talbot considered uh, interference of, uh, of an array of light sources. All light sources in his experiment were coherent, uh, just light was coming through a series of equidistant slits. 
And Talbot has noted, has observed, uh, that uh, uh, if he looks at the image of those sl uh, slits at some, at some particular distances, uh, uh, those slits are perfectly imaged. The picture in the initial, uh, the image com exactly repeated picture in the initial frame. No, exactly repeated the picture from, uh, fr from the initial plane. And uh, he published that work. He did not understand the, ori uh, the origin of this effect, but uh, from now this is called the Talbot effect. Let's try to, uh, let's understand, first let's understand this effect in the uh, language of quantum mechanics. In the language of quantum mechanics, let's, instead of coherent light sources, let's consider one dimensional wave function, psi of z. This direction is the z direction. And uh, let's say this wave function is uh, completely periodic. Psi of z equals psi of z plus d, the distance between the condensates. Oh yes, this, this is the distance between the condensates. And let's consider the time evolution of this wave function. First, the initial instant of time t equals zero. Since the wave function is periodic, the state of the system can be decomposed into Fourier series, not into the integral, but in Fourier series. So the, the, moment, the momentum, momentum states involved are discrete. Let's now apply the time evolution operator. And the Hamiltonian, yes. in this lecture series, it's important to write the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is the simplest you can imagine. It's interference, it's time evolution in the free space. Unlike Hamiltonian, we are considering a massive particle. So there is mass in the Hamiltonian and it's quadratic in momentum. So we shall apply the time evolution. And since this is this state is an eigenstate of Hamiltonian, we get the following. Oops. And you can notice that at some particular time instance, this, oh, it's important to write the state. At some particular time inst instance, this, I'm sorry, this whole phase becomes a multiple of two pi, which means this whole phase factor becomes unity and the, sta the state becomes identical to the initial state. Well, from here you can, from this uh, pre-factor you can get, uh, uh, you can even get uh, the time instance uh, when, uh, uh, when the whole phase factor becomes unity. The time scale involved is the so-called Talbot frequency. Talbot, of course, didn't know about this frequency because Planck's constant participate here. And he couldn't know about Planck. So uh, you, can, you can see this uh, 
uh, some parts of the Talbot frequency in this uh, in this in this phase factor. This is two pi over d squared, and you invert the Talbot uh, the, the Talbot frequency and get the time, and at multiples of those time instants, the initial wave function completely reappears. And of course, it's possible to plug in the numbers relevant to the experiment. The experiment is done with lithium molecules, and the distance between the wave functions is known, so that characteristic wave time is 1.7 milliseconds. After 1.7 milliseconds, the wave function reestablishes itself completely. So we didn't get to the uh, measuring correlations yet. Or I, I'm, de I'm developing the uh, first out of two necessary tools to, for the correlations. Uh, for, uh, first, uh, first of two tools needed for measuring correlations. And indeed, uh, uh, we did experiment with a such periodic system. This is the image of the Bose condensates prepared. We turned off the trap, let them spread out, interfere, and uh, photographed later at the Talbot time. And uh, almost you can see almost the same pictures reproduced. Of course, some imperfections appear, but uh, the basic effect uh, is easiest to see from the from from this graph. This graph it's four, Fourier image of the density distribution. One can take the density distribution along this direction, uh, compute, uh, 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 make Fourier transformation, and uh, get the spectrum. And in the spectrum, there is this uh, peak which corresponds to the uh, momentum, which is 2 pi over d. This is uh, the, uh, the peak in momentum at the initial point in time. And this is that same peak after the evolution. Of course, there are some noise appears. Experiment. So the phenomena I was looking for is not completely isolated from some so other. In between, this would be just just uniform, almost. Not exactly, but let me show you what happened in between. Yes, this is what happened in between. This is the initial image, and after some short expansion time. Those, uh, all those clouds more or less overlap, uh, the density becomes more or less uniform. Or at least our, si our imaging system is not good enough to observe this, uh, uh, to observe any non-uniformity. But the late is at the Talbot time, as a result of interference, uh, the density distribution reestablishes. So far, uh, no new physics, just uh, an effect from 19th century is uh, reproduced only 200 years, almost 200 years later. Okay, let's go to something new. Novelty comes from getting less order in, in the system. Let's deviate from the, uh, from the, uh, from the, the conditions of the uh, Talbot's experiment. This is again the wave function, but now each condensate has its own phase. So wave function in each peak, it's a Gaussian multiplied by own phase factors. And phase factors are unequal. What will happen, this is the initial condition, for the wave function, and let's uh, evolve this function just by applying this uh, simple, uh, the, uh, by applying the evolution operator with this simplest possible Hamiltonian. Of course, we are not expecting the Talbot effect. At the Talbot time, we do not expect to see uh, uh, this uh, ordered uh, distribution in space. What we do see in experiment? Of course, after some in initial expansion time, everything overlapped. And then, 
what unexpectedly an order appeared. So despite the phases are random, despite the phases are random, there, are, there is clear interfer interference picture with the same periodicity as in the initial distribution. But this is not taken at the Talbot time, it's taken at the half of the Talbot time. And at later time, there was also periodic distribution of the interference fringes. This is the picture that Talbot time, if you look hard, this picture is spatially periodic. But the period is twice bigger than in the Talbot effect. Here I'm developing the second tool for measuring correlations along the chain. Correlations, measurement of correlations will appear after two more slides. And this uh, indeed, uh, uh, indeed can be understood uh, in pretty simple tool by, by taking the wave function like this, so a sum of Gaussians multiplied by their own phase factors. So this is, this is the wave function which I have shown you before pictorially. One can, evo one can calculate the evolution and find this, the density spectrum. So density spectrum, it's the density, psi squared is the density, times this, uh, uh, times this exponential. And for random phases, it appears the spectrum uh, has a clear, uh, clear peaks, but uh, they, are, by, they evolve differently to the Talbot effect. The, one can calculate that uh, those peaks correspond to the spatial period, which grows linearly st in time, but uh, Talbot time still, uh, still appears. So in uh, periodic chain, th there are two possible interference effects. One is the Talbot effect, and the other is interference with Talbot with, um, with the random phases. And they give a qualitatively different uh, separation of interference fringes. And this is a, so there is clear distinguish between correlated chain and uncorrelated. And when there is qualitative distinct, uh, the, when there is qualitative difference, that's the best. Uh, that's the best tool for measuring something. So correlated and uncorrelated behave totally different. And this again demonstration of that um, interference of with random phrases uh, with random phases with progress in time and indeed at larger and larger time, harmonics at, at small and smaller moment appear. And actually, I'll skip this slide because it's unimportant for correlations. Now let's come to the correlations. So now let's look at uh, one-dimensional many-body physics. In one dimension, in one-dimensional systems, uh, no long-range order is allowed. There should be, uh, there should be always uh, some decay in the order. Phase transitions are possible in one-dimensional systems, but uh, the, uh, those are phase transitions between a different law of decay. It should be, uh, it should be, a, uh, for example, a, a, in, in such ch chain, uh, this problem uh, of phase transition was solved, I think, in the, in the 70s. There should be either exponential decay or power law decay. So th but there should be some, uh, some uh, length of coherence involved. So after, here I'm pictorially showing that uh, even if um, it's in some segment of the chain, uh, the phases are the same or nearly the same if we go further from 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 those green uh, peaks to the red peaks uh, the 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 phase should become different and um, here i'm ready to show this um, uh, correlation measurement and uh, then you would uh, see what is not finished in this measurement and where contribution is needed 
Let's now prepare such chain and for let turn off the trapping potential. Let this let those condensates expand and interfere. And this is photograph of interfering condensates. You can see you can see here the that uh, the f first, um, the, p the period should, uh, for your already trained eye, the spatial period look to you uh, same as the initial period, as the initial distance between the condensates. And uh, if you calculate spectrum for the distribution along Z, the spectrum has clear peak which corresponds to the Talbot effect. Now let's look at the, at the interference picture at a later time, two Talbot times. So each condensate expanded more and more and interfered with a bigger number of neighbors. There, well, the interference picture may look to you more or less chaotic, but the trained eye may see some order. And if you do Fourier transform, take density distribution along this direction and do Fourier transform, a peak appears which, uh, which is at much lower momentum than uh, for the Talbot effect. And this peak uh, falls within uh, the prediction of that theory I have shown you on the earlier slide. So this peak corresponds to interference with randomized phases. How to interpret these uh, two measurements? Here, pictorially, I have shown by how much a single uh, Bose-Einstein condensate spread it out. Here, you can see interference after bigger time. So each condensate spread it out much more. So here, in the second experiment, condensate is inter has interfered with a much bigger, not much, uh, twice, yes, bigger number of neighbors and it means the, uh, those more distant neighbors already have uncorrelated phases and this is a uh, the, so the so there appears a qualitative way of measuring phases by comparing how much uh, each condensate spread it out uh, the coherence length can be estimated it for it it is somewhere between 25 and 50 microns but so far it's just a very approximate estimate, and this experiment needs a quantitative understanding to turn it into a real measurement tool. So, you, you, you can see for uh, doing a measurement, it was, um, uh, it happened, uh, it was needed to, um, uh, to create and uh, un understand the whole new effect interference uh, in a chain where um, phases of each um, chain element is random. Okay, I'm, it seems I'm finishing up somewhat before uh, the scheduled time. Before I finish, I would remind you the story of Ralph Kronick, who published uh, a very important and interesting uh, theory, uh, and uh, it was important dis despite being incorrect. Uh, well, it is possible to speculate why he was so insistive to, uh, insistive to publish his very interested uh, his very interesting theory of um, uh, superconductivity. Already, Ralph Kronick has a um, uh, experience uh, seven years before this uh, publication on the uh, on on the formation of an um, uh, electron crystal. It occurred here. I read a paper by Pauli. In the paper, pa uh, Pauli pointed out that uh, 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 it seems uh, uh, occupation of each orbital in an atom is two electrons per orbital. Which, uh, which was against the Pauli principle. And um, Ralph Kronick uh, came up with the idea that uh, it should be some additional degree of freedom. 
related to um, uh, rotation of electrons. So, um, uh, so eventually Ralph Kronick came up with the idea of spin. And it happened uh, several months before this idea was published by uh, Uhlenbeck and Gutsmith. And Pauli strongly opposed um, Ralph Kronick's uh, idea about existence of spin, and uh, uh, Kronick gave up and left this uh, idea unpublished. And maybe this um, suggested him uh, that uh, it's important uh, to, uh, to publish um, ideas, even, even, even though somebody thinks that uh, they are wrong. So again, emphasizing the importance of misconception and the discussion of those misconceptions of your colleagues. And I would like to end up by showing the literature for those who, who would be interested to look into the field of ultra-cold atoms with uh, some more depth. So I guess my course is over slightly before the scheduled time. Uh, have you have you tried to make this uh, uh, BC co uh, interference not in one D but in a two D system? How hard would it be? Well, uh, physically nothing prohibits to do that. Uh, uh, technically, uh, we don't have a, a tool for that, and frankly speaking, I don't know whether this uh, this effect of uh, clear interference fringes uh, how this would uh, how this would appear in uh, two dimensions. So that question is uh, is completely unexplored. There might be something uh, interesting uh, in the spectrum, and this, this could be interesting to look at. And for 2D systems, there should be kind of a Bikati transition that was observed, right, in cold gases? Uh, yes, exactly. And for instance, if your system has also spin degrees of freedom, like spin or condensates, then you can have multiple BKT transitions probably related to different uh, other parameters. Yeah, this is indeed interesting. I don't uh, know whether anybody looked an experiment for that. Okay, how many particles uh, did you have in, in, uh, in each of these clouds? Uh, this, is, um, this experiment is a counterexample against uh, going to very large systems. It is showing that uh, uh, many body effects can be observed with very small number of particles. This is just, uh, in each cloud, this is just approximately 1,000 bosons per cloud. It's even less than uh, in that uh, uh, record experiment where the absolutely lowest uh, temperature was observed. In that record experiment, there was uh, 2,500 bosons. Here, only 1,000. Still, they form a clear BC. Yes, and the, the fact of uh, uh, the proof of BC here is the interference, and also the fact that uh, the fri the fringes are straight. If there were fluctuations of phases along the plane of the cloud, then there would be no straight fringes; they would be somehow curved. I have a comment for everybody. There is an issue which arises, I would say, at least once in 50 years. Uh, if the two condensate, independent condensate, condensates, can, can form an interference pattern. Yeah? yeah, they don't know about each other. But there is an, an interference. 50 years ago, it was the same question about two lasers. You have two independent lasers. Do they interfere? Yes, they do. Strange, why? But they do. Here it's the same. It's, 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 it's very interesting.
from the experiment, how many atoms uh, do you need to have in a single condensate to form condensate in some sense? 100 or 1,000 or... Well, unfortunately, I don't know such study. I don't know whether anybody tried. Uh, well, at least here, a thousand is enough. Yeah, it would be a good, good point. It would be interesting to look with a hundred of bosons. Of thermals as well. It's also interesting, I think. Well, in fact, uh, uh, there is a quarter of an answer to your question from atomic physics. Uh, in atomic phy uh, I'm sorry, from, uh, there is, a, there is a, uh, a small answer to your question from nuclear physics. In nuclear physics, uh, there is still a discussion of uh, Cooper pairing uh, inside um, atomic, um, uh, nu atomic uh, nuclei, and uh, such, pairing, um, such pairing was uh, even observed. And there, uh, there is an order of 100 particles. I also don't remember the exact numbers, but uh, for superconductors, there is a big, uh, big part of experiments related to superconductivity of small islands. Mm -hmm. As they count electrons there, they clearly distinguish between odd and even number of electrons there. So those islands are indeed small number of Cooper pairs, is indeed very finite. Still, they are so superconducting. That is part. Mm -hmm. What is interesting is, in order to define condensate, you need to work in some sense in the representation where the number of particles is not fixed. Yeah. But here you still work with small ensembles where the number of particles is fixed, but you still have a collective phenomena like superfluidity or superconductivity. From the theoretical side, for instance, you have shown this Bogolubov theory. You always work in the representation with the, si the number of particles is not fixed. Yeah, it's extremely interesting. Sorry, yeah. I, I would compliment. To have, to have a well-defined number of particles, you must totally forget about the, uh, the phase, right? Mm -hmm. So. This means, this picture means that you do not have a definite number of particles at least in each cloud. Maybe the, the, the overall number of particles is uh, an integer number, but you still must have some, some indeterminate uh, number of particles in each cloud. But once you have 100 of particles, then, or 1,000 of particles, they can tunnel some Yeah, particles. yeah, that, that's what I mean. There must be some tunneling. Well, tunneling, what tunneling does, tunneling brings about uh, locking of the phases of the condensates. In this initial demonstration, uh, where the Talbot effect is demonstrated, this demonstration requires nearly the same phase between uh, the condensates. And this is only achieved by tunneling. And in this limit of uh, nearly equal phases, uh, uh, the number of particles is not, def is not defined uh, inside each cloud. May I ask if, if, you thought, if, if it would be possible to make this in such a way that maybe some of these, uh, you know, some of these uh, column sites are, are full, filled with atoms, and some are empty? Would you see sort of a movement of this? Okay. Because I would expect that based on the Hamiltonian that you showed. I'm, I'm sorry. What co what would be the consequences of some um, of some tra traps being empty? Yeah, that's my question. Oh. Yeah. Well, uh, movement as a whole, I don't see why, frankly speaking. So you, you had this Hamiltonian that you showed in the board, right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically the, the momentum operator. Yes, it's still yes, it's still it's still on the board. Well, to get translation, some phase gradient would be needed. Yes, if a phase gradient is applied across uh, across this whole system of condensates, yes, definitely there should be a translation. But uh, coming back uh, between physical terms, applying a phase gradient means uh, the system would be pushed. Yes, if we pushed it, of course, it would be translated. Probably Joseph's on junctions. Yes, right. yes, yes.
And indeed, uh, Josephson Junction in such system is also observable. And mm -hmm. with your uh, equipment in Nizhny Novgorod, can you explore something like trenches and thermalization and all this far from equilibrium dynamics? Uh, yes, so if uh, some uh, clever suggestion uh, comes, we uh, we, sh we should be uh, we would be very glad to uh, search for Pagosov uh, effect. <laughs>